Biology is definitely thought as one of the most content heavy subjects out there, which is why a lot of students actually struggle to grasp it. However, once you understand and refine your approach to biology and learn some of the secret techniques that some of the top achievers are using to get every single little mark, then you'll be well on your way to acing this subject. Hey guys, welcome back. Archer here, a second year medical student. And on this channel, we learn how to learn so we can spend our time more intentionally on the things and people that matter to us. After my videos on how to prepare for maths, physics, chemistry. A lot of you have been requesting for me to do a biology video and I thought that it would be very appropriate for me to wear more of a green collar. So today we're going to be going through why biology is so hard, how to understand biology, flashcards, Kolb's experiential cycle, and then a discussion around tests and exams. A lot of these things are actually wish that I knew and applied in year 12 because now studying in medicine, I've had to change a lot of the way about how I study and I can see these things being extremely beneficial for my own students who are doing this in biology now. So many people find biology a very difficult subject because it's quote unquote, a heavy content based subject. Because of this assumption, a lot of people, when they get into uh, the higher levels of biology, where there's just a lot of content that's being gone through, they attempt to memorize as much as possible. And this in fact actually makes matters worse. When you approach any sort of subject with this mindset, this is gonna make it very hard for you to grasp the contents and actually relate between them and make those sort of connections. And in fact, uh, between the highest achiever and yourself, this is gonna be the thing that actually separates both of you. The reason that I say this is because if you go and ask the high achiever to relate two concepts together, specifically the ones that you're asking, they're going to be able to draw a link and a relationship between the two. And that's because they understand the content a lot more deeply. And when I say deeply, they know how things are much more interconnected. Now, because there's so much content to go through within biology, there becomes a need to feel like I need to memorize absolutely every single little thing that has been gone through in the textbook, in my lectures, by the teacher. You know, it's just way too much to memorize. Well, it's not really too much to memorize, but it would just take up too much time to memorize it. So you you want to make sure that you're learning through layers instead of just focusing on the arbitrary details and the facts and stuff like, for example, knowing the exact structure of the mitochondria without even knowing what the mitochondria does within the cell. You need to know that bigger picture first before you start looking into some of the details. There are so many cases where I might ask like a year 12 about how does, I don't know, let's just say, how does gel electrophoresis work? And they can answer that perfectly, but then they don't actually even know the cases in which gel electrophoresis might be used and why you might want to use this in, a, in an experiment and fit it within your design. That would probably be the first question when I'm learning about gel electrophoresis. Why is gel electrophoresis important? Before discussing more about how we can actually go ahead and understand biology as opposed to just memorize it, we actually need to understand the structure of the subject itself. As uncomfortable as it might be, you have to leave the mindset of trying to memorize everything. In fact, in most cases, and I'll give you an example, if you understand some underlying principles and concepts, then you'll be able to infer the little details that you have to memorize. So an example that I just thought off the top of my head is knowing what sort of things are going to passively diffuse through the phospholipid bilayer and things that are not. You might memorize things like urea or glucose or uh, ions and proteins and glucose and water. like you might try and memorize which of those are actually going to go through the membrane and not. Or you could understand some key principles about what is going to allow something in or not. For example, I don't have to memorize that glucose isn't going to go in and it has to go through a transporter instead. Instead, I can think about glucose being a big molecule that it's probably not going to fit through the small gaps between the phospholipid bilayer. Or I can think about polarity. So for example, water is a polar molecule, which means it's going to want to stay around water because it's also polar. Whereas the phospholipid bilayer, the inside is non-polar with those fatty acids. So it doesn't want to go through that. And this goes on and on. So we can think about ions, they're charged. They're not going to want to go through. We can think about particular hormones. If they're lipophilic, well, they're fat loving. So they love the fatty acids inside. They're going to go through. This way, I don't have to memorize if estradiol or cholesterol or, or any other of these sort of steroids, hormones or anything like that, the specific details are going to go through or not. I just need to know a specific characteristic about it and I will be able to determine if it's probably going to go through or not. And this happens time and time again within biology and other areas where you don't actually have to memorize a whole list, but understand a few key principles, which will allow you to determine things about that whole list uh, without any need for memorization. So the other thing that we have to think about is what do we think 
the questions in our tests and exams are going to actually require of us. They're not going to be asking us lots of definition and questions. That's like year 10, year nine stuff. And the thing in year 12 is that most of the questions are actually going to be application based, which is what a lot of people struggle with, because not only do you need to know the content, but know how to apply it in that particular scenario. So it's not only knowing the content now, but being able to mold it and craft it to create a response for a particular question that you might have not ever seen before. It might introduce you to a disease that you've never ever ever heard about before, but it, it, it comes from underlying concepts like osmosis or ADH, you know, sort of how like uh, our electrolyte balances come, come about and things like that. Who knows? But you need to know what are the underlying concepts so that you can apply it to answer that question. So how do you do that? Well, it's not by focusing on memorizing the content. This is generally what happens for most exams. 80% of the examed questions is going to be made up of 20% of the concepts. So if you master that 20% of concepts like to the brim, then you're going to be pretty safe for those 80% of questions. So what this really means is that 80% of your time should be spent on building relationships and connections between all of these different concepts. Because when it comes to that very difficult question, most of the time you can't answer it or see how it even works is because you do not know the connection between two concepts that it might be asking you about. And then 20% of your effort should be spent memorizing the little details that just have to be memorized. For example, that blood glucose levels vary between 75 and 95 milligrams per deciliter. That's like a fact that's just been drilled into my brain and there's no sort of understanding that I can really take into that. So the things that should be pure memorized are usually just gonna be stats or facts. Notice how I didn't say definitions. Definitions can still be understood to know why this must impact this and etc. And when I spoke to all of the high achievers that I know who perform in biology, they tell me the same. It's not not just about memorization. And this is what the research shows us as well. So let's look at some general tips to begin with to understand biology more deeply. This stuff also applies to other subjects. And so the first thing that you really wanna focus on is being genuinely curious about aspects of biology. So you always wanna be asking how and why. And this is a way to incite curiosity within your learning. And, and the research shows very well that, you know, in having curiosity is gonna make it easier for you to learn. Now, often your best subject is gonna be the one that you're most curious about, the one where you ask the most questions. So if we can kind of force this into other subjects like biology, that can help us a lot. So what's the backbone of building all of your understanding? You need to find the big picture and how everything relates big picture. And the way to do that is by asking the importance of each big concept that you're learning. So when you start to move topics and you might go from learning about the mitochondria and energy in the beginning, and then learning about DNA and proteins, you wanna find the link between DNA and proteins and how that relates to the mitochondria and how it's important. Not only will this consolidate and make it easier for you to know what DNA and proteins are for, but it'll help you revising that mitochondria knowledge. Okay, so you just learned about mitosis. How does that relate to meiosis? What are the similarities, the differences? Link this to binary fission. So binary fission only happens in prokaryotes and in eukaryotes we can have mitosis which is going to create clones and then we can also have meiosis to create gametes. So you can see very quickly that a question is definitely going to probably ask you about how do meiosis and mitosis differ between each other. So in asking yourself these sort of questions not only does it make it easier for yourself and your brain to frame it in terms of a problem and a solution, which is what our brain loves to do, you also start to begin to think like an examiner, which makes it easier for you to test yourself on knowledge which you might actually need to know. So the next most important thing is gonna be effective pre-study. And I've talked about this in a whole video before, so make sure to go check that out if you haven't already. But the main idea is that you're trying to create a bookshelf for all of the books that you're gonna add on to it. What do I mean? So the books are like all of the knowledge that you're gonna be learning, and you need a place to put those books. So essentially most people will just uh, have all of the information information thrown at them and then they'll stack those books up to, uh, up on top of a pile. But that's a lot of disorganized information. Eventually, if you wanted to, you know, figure out what osmosis is, you're going to have to take off all of the, t the, the books on the top and then you have to access that piece of information and then you can put it back and then you put all the top file back on. That's a lot of time, which is what your brain is going to have to do as it tries to struggle to recall that information. So what we can do instead is by having effective pre-study, we're creating a bookshelf so that all of the books are very, very easy, they're easily accessible and that knowledge can be recalled quicker and we're gonna be able to retain it for longer because we always know where it is in the bookshelf. Now, what does effective pre-study actually look like? Like a bookshelf, you have to have structure and organization. This means 
not only just looking through all of the keywords or, or things that you might be learning pretty soon, but actually knowing enough about each of these key concepts that you might be able to make a guess of how these things might relate together. Notice how I didn't say to learn the content early. You're not going to dive into the details straight away. You need to do learning in layers. So this first layer, if you think about, you know, the wall here with paint, you're gonna do a layer of primer first before you put on the coats of paint. If you wanna think about it in terms of building your knowledge, you need to have that uh, pre-study as your primer, and then you can have the coats of learning through the content and learning all the big concepts, and then you can have another layer of learning all the smaller concepts and the important details and then the arbitrary details after that. So if you don't have a level of effective pre-study before learning the content and hearing it the first time in class, then you're actually already on the back foot because the research kind of shows us that one hour of effective pre-study saves 10 hours of studying later on because eventually you're going to have to create that bookshelf, whether it be naturally or not. So when we can do it very, very early on in the process, we are saving ourselves time by not having to have a stack of pile of books and then book the, make the bookshelf and then put all of it onto the bookshelf. What we're doing right this way is that we're going to make the bookshelf and then put all the books onto the bookshelf straight away. Hopefully that gets the idea across. Okay, so just to recap, the two things that you really have to pay attention to is knowing the importance of each concept that you're learning and how they relate with previous concepts that you've been learning or something else. So the main way that our memory works and the research shows this is through connections and relationships. And even if you are someone who loves to memorize, right? And you can't get away from just writing everything down just so you don't forget it. Well, the thing is, these relationships and concepts are all about how you can memorize things, but also at the same time, understand these concepts. Well, what's the best way to actually relate all of these things together? Well, that's actually through mind maps. So I'm gonna quickly show you one uh, for the nervous system, which I did a way, way back, but it's a good idea to show you a beginner level mind map. Okay, so what we can see very clearly is we have the beginning of the mind map, which is the nervous system. And you can see this by all the bolded lines around it. Now, from there, I want to break up the nervous system into some chunks. These are gonna be the key things that are important when I consider the nervous system. And for me, that was the organization of the nervous system movement and nerve fibers. Then from there, I can continue to do this thing called chunking where you break a big concept into smaller chunks. This just makes everything a lot easier because if you look at this number that I show you, well, it's a lot easier to remember in three chunks instead of just the whole 10 digit, 10 digit thing itself. Now, as you can see on this mind map, there is a lack of words, and that's because I genuinely understand some of the concepts that I don't have to write down. Well, you might be asking me, well, I need this notes as a reference so that I can check up on it later. Well, then, you know, if I look at microanatomy, I can just, you know, search this up on Google if I needed to. So it's really not necessary. And the thing here as well is that you can see these bold lines show the main connections. And that's another thing as well. You have to be able to prioritize what are going to be the biggest relationships to make. And another thing that you notice with this mind map is that there are a lot of visuals and lack of words yet again. And that's because our processing of imagery can be so much, much quicker than a big block of text. So if we look at this thing here, I can tell you exactly everything that's here. Now, because I spent the time to create some of these images that are abstract, right? They're very different, unique. They're going to make most sense to me and not to you. So I I can look at something here. So for example, the Merkel uh, receptors, which is gonna detect Braille. Um, we've got the, the um, Moisner uh, corpuscle. We've got the Ruffinian uh, corpuscle and um, we've got the Piscinian corpuscle. Now I can detect all of these things just from these images, which I can memorize very well in my head as well. And I can also remember the layers of these sort of skin receptors within the hand. Now you also might have some um, rebuttals to this and say that this just takes a long amount of time. Well, I would argue that if you have to relearn things, that's gonna take even more time because if you don't know as many things, well then it's actually gonna make it harder for you to learn new things. What do I mean by this? Well, if you forget things from weeks one to three, and then you're learning content in weeks uh, five, six, and seven, without the knowledge in weeks one to three, it's gonna be harder to know the, the new content. So you always wanna be rem remembering things as long as you can. And with all my experience working with a lot of students and seeing this firsthand, you know, the biggest time waster is gonna be time relearning and revising. So if we can spend more time up front to save a lot more time later on, that's gonna be a huge win. So how am I creating these chunks? Well, I'm always thinking about why is this thing particularly important? So for example, 
the nervous system is very important for movement and the neural pathways are very important for movement. And so therefore the ascending and descending pathways are very important as well. And you can create these subtrunks in that way. And also in these things, you can see by how many lines are going around, there are a lot of relationships. These do not show in linear note-taking. And what do I mean by linear note-taking? I mean by just top to bottom down the page. And by the way, I'm also making a video like extremely going into the detail of research behind mind maps and why it is the best way to take notes. And I'm very happy to be proven wrong about this. Okay, that's a little bit about the mind map. I've got a whole video coming up on this very soon, but that should be good enough to get you guys started on this. Okay, let's talk about flashcards. Now, when I first learned about flashcard, I definitely went into flashcard overload, which meant I had like 2000 plus flashcards and I never got through all of them, even before my exam. I always fell off the Anki treadmill and then I'd have way too many due cards and it would be overwhelming to come back to it. And then I wouldn't even know what any of this meant. Another thing as well is I got very good at doing the specific flashcards and not actually at answering and understanding those concepts. Anki is definitely the best app for flashcards, but flashcards are a really, really good tool when used correctly. And part of the problem is that a lot and a lot of students, even a lot of the YouTubers out there who promote Anki and stuff, don't use it in the most effective way because they're relying on Anki a lot of the time to uh, memorize things that should be understood instead. So I would say that maybe 20% of biology content should be on flashcards. If not, it should actually be a lot less. In fact, in my study system now, flashcards maybe makes up like 2% of all of the content that I store onto notes and things. And the reason for that is because I have a very em heavy emphasis on understanding this. So remember again, only facts and stats should go onto flashcards. Now, if we think about my mind map again, if there are ways for you to more abstractly demonstrate these things in a very cool image, that's probably gonna be better than flashcards because the amount of active learning that goes into doing something like that is gonna make it very easy for you to remember later on. And if you get a flashcard wrong more than three times, then you probably have to take a look back at the content to actually go ahead and understand. All right, let's talk about Kolb's experiential cycle. And I explain this all the time for every single subject that I show you in year 12. So here are the things that we need to think about. Having a concrete experience, having reflective observation, abstract conceptualization, and then lastly, active experimentation. So for basically everything that I have mentioned, we are building skills in this video. And when you're doing questions, that is also gonna be building a skill. So you need to try it out. That's the concrete experience. Then you need to have a reflection on it, obviously, and think about how that went. But don't just think about if it went well or good or not. Think very genuinely about what about it went well? What about it didn't go so well? What are the things that I think could I, I've done better? And then you have the abstract conceptualization. So this is where you start to make some of your hypotheses. Well, maybe if I bold my arrows, it's gonna make it easier for me to kind of see what's gonna be the most important connections between these concepts. And then lastly, you have the active experimentation, which is you doing the whole process again. As the year goes on, you keep doing this cycle. And the more times that you can do this cycle within a day, the more that you're gonna be able to extract more learning from each uh, opportunity that you give yourself. And the same thing happens with doing practice questions. If you get a question correctly, you can still use that and extract some learning out of it by using Kolb's experiential cycle. And this is a model that represents the way that people can learn very, very quickly through these high feedback models. So now for the most important part, tests and exams. How come there are still a lot of students who know all of the content and memorize all the definitions and everything like that, but still do poorly in the exam? It's because these questions are more application-based and you need to apply all of your knowledge within the particular scenario given. Now, because questions are like this, shouldn't all of your learning in the beginning be thinking about how this might be applied in particular contexts and scenarios? That's why we ask, why is it important? Do you see how this is all coming together now? Now, here's the thing. You have to be curious and want to learn about how these particular things all link together. And the thing is, when you're learning, this is very, very, very hard. It is mentally challenging to think about these things when you're just learning about something for the very first time. And what you will want to do is go very deep into the details about how everything specifically works and then think about how this is all relevant to you. It's the wrong way to go about it. Your brain will be not primed to learn all that little, little details and it just won't know what's really going on. So don't be lazy and fall into the trap of doing the exact same thing that you've always been doing back in year 10, nine and eight, whatever, because those are techniques you've built for 
years 10 and below. In year 11 and year 12, it starts to switch up. When you go into university, it gets more difficult. There's more content. You need techniques that match the challenge of whatever year that you're in. And that means things have to be different. Another thing as well that's very important is that you familiarize yourself with the marking scheme. And a lot of the things that I try and mention are not stuff that go around word of mouth and stuff, but this is just a given. You need to know how the markers are going to be marking. And so you know what keywords that you need to be focusing on. But again, you need to build a strategy that helps you predict what those keywords are going to be when you see a particular question because you're not going to be able to see a marking scheme and marking criteria for every single question type possible because every exam contains questions you've never seen before. You also need to think about the structure and all of your learning and how it occurs. You need to have pre-study, then you need to have learning, and then you need to have revision of the concepts untimed. Once you build up an accuracy with the content untimed, then you can do timed practice tests. It's a wasted opportunity if you do a timed test when you haven't even reached 100% accuracy untimed first. Because at best, if you were getting 80% of accuracy untimed, that's the best that you could get with speed, but it's likely to be a lot less because there's more time pressure and all these sort of things. And because practice tests and exams are a random selection of questions, you're not gonna be tested on everything again, it's just a random pull, and this is your ability to see how you might perform on the day. Don't use this particularly as a way to identify all your weaknesses with the knowledge, only to identify if you have issues with time management, being stressed out, or having anxiety going through the test, or um, just anything to do with you know time management, for, let's say. Issues with knowledge itself should be identified through the practice questions that you do beforehand. And another thing as well is that you're not always going to have all the practice questions. So you need to make some of your own that you think are things that you currently struggle with uh, with the content and what you think the examiner might test you on. And these are usually between two concepts that might seem unrelated, but actually are related. It always comes back to relationships. And if you really make an effort to try some of these things out by the time exams come, then you'll be well equipped with the skills to be able to ace a subject like biology. And by the way, if you have exams at the end of the year for year 12, um, have you started your exam preparation yet? I really want you to think about it because this is a time where it becomes very crucial to start thinking about this. Otherwise, term three is just gonna be very, very, very busy. And then you won't be able to start until your term three break before your exams. And that's when it's really, really way too late. So if you're really, again, trying to score differently from everyone else, you have to be doing things differently, which means you need to start a lot earlier. That's only one of the things that can begin to make a difference. There's only one little part of the equation. What you do with that time is what is gonna set you up for those exams. So please, please don't make mistakes as everyone else and just think that hard work and studying early is gonna make all the difference. Begin to use some of these techniques that are gonna make all of your learning and revision much higher quality. All right, hopefully you enjoy this guys and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.